The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the death of the Right Honourable Sir John Kerr on the 24th of March marked the passing of a great Australian. His greatness will be measured not by the verdicts of his contemporaries, nor by our words here today, but it will be measured by history's judgment of the breadth of his achievements and on his quiet but unmistakable moral courage. And that is exactly the way Sir John would have wanted it. At his memorial service last Saturday, one of his sons, Philip, recalled his deep love of history. It is appropriate, therefore, that history will be the judge and will, I believe, judge him favourably. Mr Speaker, I do not intend to record the detail of Sir John Kerr's many achievements in his academic, professional and public life. The Prime Minister has already cited many of them and others will undoubtedly recall even more. My purpose today is a quite different one. I want to set out briefly what seemed to me to be the attributes that made Sir John Kerr a great Australian and that explain why he was held in such great affection by those who knew him well. Mr Speaker, there is no such thing as an ordinary Governor-General. But of all the extraordinary men who have held that high office in Australia, Sir John Kerr stands out. He stands out because of his extra extraordinary achievements prior to his vice-regal career. He stands, he stands out because he was Governor-General during an extraordinary period in Australia's political history. And he stands out because he brought such extraordinary insight and courage to the discharge of his duties. Let me say at the outset that it would be a travesty of Sir John's life and his achievements in so many fields if our reflections on him become little more than an excuse to try and rewrite the history of the 1975 constitutional crisis. Sir John's actions in November 1975 are, of course, a source of continuing debate and, regrettably, still some rancour. Certainly no assessment of Sir John Kerr's life and his achievements can neglect the high drama of late 1975. But his greatness is not dependent on his actions at that time. His greatness was, I believe, enhanced by the moral courage he showed in 1975. But it is not those events alone that mark him as a great Australian. It is his achievements throughout his life and his basic human qualities that are the true measure of the man and the true mark of his greatness. First, Sir John Kerr was a true nationalist who loved his country without deluding himself about its shortcomings. He described himself in later years as a Europhile who still calls Australia home. His achievements were the product of his own hard work. He owed nothing to patronage or to favour or to privilege. The achievements of his life, therefore, were the product of a country that gave him a fair go and that allowed him to fulfil his extraordinary talent. In turn, he never forgot what Australia had made possible for him. He remained throughout his life distinctly and proudly Australian. Second, Sir John was an internationalist ahead of his time. He recognised long before most others and quite early in his own life that Australia could never have an effective foreign policy if it failed to perceive the winds of change in its own regional neighbourhood. For example, as early as his time at Fort Street Boys High School, he won the Everett Memorial Prize for the best essay on the subject, Should Australia Become More Enterprising in the Pacific? His wartime service in the Army's Directorate of Research and Civil Affairs created an intense interest and expertise in the processes of decolonisation. He became principal of the Australian School of Pacific Administration from 1945 to 1948 and implemented far-sighted and very progressive views on what was needed to achieve effective autonomy and independence in the Pacific Territories and Papua New Guinea in particular. In the late 1950s, Sir John became energetically involved in planning for the future of Papua New Guinea and it was fitting that in September 1975 he was present as Governor-General at Papua New Guinea's independence celebrations. Third, Sir John provided the Australian legal profession with a unique quality of leadership, born of his outstanding legal knowledge, 
his willingness to promote sensible change and his capacity to galvanise potentially divided opinions in a common cause. His brilliant university career was followed by a distinguished period as a barrister, as a legal administrator, as a judge, as Chief Justice and as Governor General. In all these phases, he was a towering and inspiring figure in the profession. He was at various times President of the Law Council of Australia, Foundation President of the Law Association of Asia and the Pacific, and President of the New South Wales Bar Association. In all these leadership roles, he challenged his own professional colleagues, insisting that standards be maintained, but never afraid to promote the cause of reform, especially in administrative law and judicial reform. In both areas, he has left an indelible mark. Fourth, Sir John Kerr had an intellectual fearlessness and a moral courage which few Australians have surpassed. His intellectualism was not of the ivory tower kind. It was intensely practical. It was concerned in particular with how the administration of law affected ordinary people, their rights, their aspirations, their values. Sir John's clear sense of duty and moral courage was evident throughout his career. It was evident in his struggle against communism in the trade union movement during the 1950s. It was evident in his work as a judge on the Commonwealth Industrial Court. It was evident in his law reform work. It was, above all, evident in the constitutional crisis of 1975. I said earlier that Sir John Kerr's actions in November 1975 enhanced his greatness, but did not alone create it. This is not the occasion to debate in depth the rights and wrongs of the decision made on the 11th of November 1975. But insofar as they, are, they involve Sir John Kerr, the following needs to be said. Sir John Kerr was required to involve himself in a crisis that was not of his making. At a critical moment in our history, no Governor-General was better qualified in terms of legal expertise and practice to cope with such a constitutional crisis than Sir John Kerr. He did his duty well as he saw it, knowing full well that many of his oldest friends would, rev would revile him for it. He acted properly and courageously in the discharge of his duties. Mr Speaker, it is, a, it is most revealing to note that two of the most important writers on the reserve powers of the Crown under the Westminster system were men of the left. Dr H. V. Evatt in Australia, with whom Sir John Kerr shared a close personal and professional relationship, and the Canadian socialist and constitutional expert, Dr Eugene Forsey. Dr Everett was not alive to comment on Sir John Kerr's action. Dr Forsey was, and his verdict was clear. Dr Forsey wrote in the epilogue to Sir John's book, Matters of Judgment, that, and I quote, never for a moment did I doubt the correctness of the action Sir John took. For the life of me, I could not see, and still cannot see, what else he could have done in the circumstances. The constitutional right of the Senate to refuse or defer supply seems to me incontestable. Perhaps it should never have been given that right, but it was. Dr Forsey's conclusion is one I heartily share. His verdict was that Sir John Kerr's actions in November 1975 were, and I quote, constitutionally correct, necessary and inescapable. The French put it well when they say, we owe respect to the living and to the dead nothing but truth. In his lifetime, Sir John Kerr did not always get the respect that his talents and public service deserved. In death, this parliament and all Australians owe it to him to record the truth about his life and not to indulge in myth-making. So let us be honest about a few things. Let us acknowledge openly that Sir John Kerr became the easy target for many whose personal ambitions for power were frustrated by his action. It was easier to blame the umpire than to try and understand why the Australian people voted as they did in December 1975. It was easier for politicians of the time to make Sir John Kerr the issue than to admit their own failings. Let us recognise that for too long, there was an excessive focus on how the 1975 constitutional crisis was resolved, not how it arose and how it escalated. Without that escalation, 
there would have been no constitutional crisis in 1975. It escalated because a Prime Minister denied supply by an upper house, failed to do his constitutional duty of either resigning or advising a dissolution of the lower house. And yet it was Sir John Kerr alone who became the focus of the blame for the crisis. Let us concede that if there are defects in our constitution, it is our responsibility to fix them and not to blame honest men and women who implement the constitution as it stands. And above all, let us consign forever to the dustbin of history all those myths that embittered opponents of Sir John's actions have created or have encouraged over the years. Myths such as that Sir John acted without legal authority, or that he deliberately acted in a politically partisan way, or that he alone was responsible for dividing the nation, or the familiar but irrational taunt that he was somehow a traitor to his class. If ever there was a case of embittered men and women playing the man and not the ball, it was in the case of Sir John Kerr and in relation to his role in the 1975 crisis. The myths about 1975 that some people still try to cultivate reflect only on them and not on the integrity and not on the contribution of Sir John Kerr. Mr Speaker, Sir John Kerr was a great Australian, not just because of the qualities and achievements I've touched on, his patriotism, his foresight about our region, his legal career and his moral courage. He will also be remembered as a great Australian because of his human qualities, his love for his family, his joy in living, his sense of humour, his capacity for warmth and friendship, his kindness and compassion, his humility. All the qualities so movingly referred to by his friends and family at his memorial service last Saturday. Two of them referred in particular to the words of Sir John's friend, the poet James Macaulay, who wrote of him, and I quote, that he is in fact a soft-hearted person who greatly dislikes taking part in the infliction of hurt on anyone, though in the end he will do what a common sense practical judgment seems to require as right and necessary. That is an epitaph, Mr Speaker, that most of us would happily settle for. Of all Sir John Kerr's great human qualities, however, none were greater than his lack of bitterness and his basic humanity. Few Australians in our history have been so subject, been, been the subject of such an intense personal vilification as Sir John Kerr. None has been as dignified as him in their refusal to respond in kind. Indeed, Mr Speaker, he relied on the power of rational and substantive argument. Those who vilified him in such a personal and vindictive way uh, or who insisted that we all maintain our rage against him will have to live with their own conscience. But Sir John's conscience was always clear and he never stooped to returning their bitter words. Mr Speaker, in Sir John Kerr's passing, Australia has lost one of its most outstanding citizens. Lesser people have tried to tear him down. Some will continue to try, but they will not succeed because in the cool light of history, Sir John Kerr's achievements and human qualities will be seen for what they truly were. Sir John began his book, Matters of Judgment, with a quote from the American Declaration of Independence, which reads, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Sir John Kerr's private life and public career were inspired by that ideal. To Sir John's wife, and children, who were the real centre of his life, I convey the deep sympathy of all members on this side of the House and our admiration for his distinguished contribution to Australian life. The